Hello and welcome back to MIT webinar series. First of all, wish you a very happy new year 2020. It's my pleasure to bring you back this series with refreshed content and some of the more relevant topics covering the tracks of modern infrastructure and machine intelligence. My name is Janaki Ram. I'm going to be the presenter. I'm a certified Kubernetes admin and a Kubernetes app developer. Today, I'm going to talk to you about configuring pods for production deployments. This is going to be an interesting topic and pretty comprehensive. So I may not be able to cover all the concepts, but I'll make sure I, I touch upon the most important aspects of production deployments and configuration for pods in production deployments. So if you are new to MI2, let me set the context. So MI2 stands for Machine Intelligence and Modern Infrastructure. Every other Thursday, I bring you a session on either the infrastructure track that essentially covers Kubernetes, service mesh, serverless computing, edge computing, uh, and, and some of the emerging technologies around modern infrastructure. And the machine intelligence track is all about IoT, AI at edge, deep learning, cognitive computing, bots, and so on. So I look at the convergence of these two as the future of the technology stack. And every webinar is going to be complemented by a tutorial, code, and of course, the video is going to be put up on my YouTube channel. So <clears throat> before I go any further, let me bring up a quick poll to make sure that you're able to listen to the audio and uh, watch, the, watch the screen. So let me know if you have trouble and I'll try to help you with that. All right, so looks like you know, most of you have a good experience with uh, the audio visuals. So that's actually good to know. So let me close the poll and get started with today's webinar. So, <clears throat> you know, most of us are familiar with Kubernetes pods and how they are deployed, and we are experienced in configuring pods. But there are certain aspects of pods, and of course, that extends to deployments, that actually make it a, a basic hygiene to deploy production workloads. So I'm going to touch upon them. So I have five important rules or best practices for configuring pods and deployments running in production. I'm going to talk to you about choosing the right controller type. You know, based on my personal experience, I have seen developers and operators uh, sometimes getting confused on what kind of a controller sh uh, should we use and what, what are the scenarios that will uh, align with them. So I'm going to touch upon that aspect. And then uh, container probs are very, very important. They pro provide basic hygiene and basic health checks for your workloads running in production. So we will take a closer look at container probs and discuss various probs that are available. Um, then another challenge that we often face with production deployments is how do we ensure that pods are provisioned and, and launched in a specific sequence? For example, you don't want to launch a WordPress pod before the MySQL pod kicks in. So how do you make sure that you initialize the containers the right way and wait for the rest of the containers to get started? Um, then I'm going to talk to you about applying node and pod affinity and anti-affinity rules, um, which makes it pretty interesting to target niche workloads that run on specialized uh, nodes and node pools. So I'm going to talk about that. And finally, I will um, uh, share uh, the, the importance of vertical pod auto scaling, horizontal pod auto scaling and cluster scaling. So those are the five things. By no means this is the most comprehensive list of running production workloads, but I think based on my personal experience of working with multiple customers, I have seen uh, these are the baseline uh, uh, capabilities and checklist that you need to follow when you are going live with a workload. So let's get started. But before I go any further, let me, okay, I think we are, we are set, okay. So Kubernetes controllers. Now, controllers are the most essential building blocks of Kubernetes. We all know that the pod is basically the um, core deployment unit. So when you, when you are launching anything in Kubernetes, the fundamental unit of deployment is always a pod. And we often take a container, wrap it in a pod, and uh, launch it within Kubernetes. But a pod is very minimalistic and maybe a bare bone deployment uh, to run a container within Kubernetes. In reality, you should never run a pod as a pod. Instead, you should target one of the controllers 
and Kubernetes has multiple controllers. For example, the replica set and replication controller that were very popular in the early days uh, gave us the capability of running pods uh, in a specific number of instances. You know, the baseline is defined as a part of replication controller or replica set, and uh, you can always make sure that the pod is uh, running those many instances at any given point of time. But over a period of time, uh, replica replication controllers got replaced by replica set and replica sets are now uh, superseded by deployment. So a deployment is an essential uh, building block or rather a controller to run stateless uh, containers and stateless pods. So even if you have just one pod and uh, it is not doing much, you might still want to package it as a deployment and, uh, and, and use the deployment object deployment controller uh, to get better performance. I'm going to talk to you about that in a, in a second in the next slide. The other thing is anytime you are running a workload that is stateful and expects certain naming convention and naming service, it is better to run it as a stateful set. For example, when you're running a Cassandra that expects the minimum quorum to be uh, three nodes of a cluster and you always want the node to contain a specific well-defined name that you can always look up because you are actually enabling replication. Uh, the, the best way of doing that is using stateful set. Stateful set solves an interesting problem where uh, in Kubernetes pods are very ephemeral. You know, pods uh, can, can get killed and they can get recreated and every time they get recreated, they assume a new name, they assume a new IP address. And it's very hard for us to uh, talk to a pod directly. Of course, we have a service, but a service is um, very hard in terms of creating a cluster. So stateful set creates a uh, headless service, which is going to be the uh, conduit or the router for multiple pods that are running in the stateful set. And every pod of a stateful set has a well-defined, well-known name. So even if you kill one of the pods of a stateful set, uh, the, the new pod will automatically inherit the uh, same name as the previous pod and it can join the cluster and you know the replication can start and it will start synchronizing and all of that. So every time you need to run a stateful workload in a clustered environment and you expect um, well-known naming convention, well-known uh, discovery mechanism, it's always better to run stateful set. In fact, I would say never ever try to run Postgres, MySQL, Cassandra, MariaDB, any of those without packaging them as a stateful set. Even if you have just a few pods and not the entire cluster, it is always better to run, run it as a stateful set because with stateful set, you have a very clear uh, demarcation between the underlying storage and the pod. So uh, even if you lose a pod, uh, the controller will bring it back with exactly the same naming convention. It will carry the same arbitrary index and it just makes it easy for you to continue with the database clustering. And finally, there is a daemon set. You know, in a lot of scenarios, you actually want to run one pod per node. So if you have a cluster with three nodes, how do you ensure that a pod runs on every node? One way of doing that is you know, label the node and you use the node selector inside the pod and you target a specific node by using the node selector. But uh, what happens in an auto-scaling environment, a new node shows up and how do you deploy uh, a pod to that? Uh, so to avoid the complexity and to make sure that a, a pod runs on any node, there's a concept called daemon set. So a daemon set is essentially a pod that gets scheduled on any node of the Kubernetes cluster. Even those nodes that show up later will automatically have a daemon set up and running. And for some reason, if the pod that is running as a part of daemon set dies, the Kubernetes controller brings them back. So you always have a mechanism to run a cron, uh, not exactly a cron job, but a background job or a daemon um, always on a node. Uh, what are the use cases? Well, if you want to initialize the node before you start deploying your workload, you package that initialization code into a container and you package that container into a daemon set and deploy it. Uh, for example, when you're running GlustrFS or NFS and you want the node to join the existing NFS uh, share, the best way of doing that is to create a container package it as a daemon set and pass the NFS mount uh, point as the parameter so that you know every time a node comes up, it automatically joins the NFS uh, 
file share and you have uh, an NFS share available for the workload to target that uh, very classic use case. So that is how we use demon sets. But coming back, you know, deployments are um, declarative updates. They provide declarative updates for pods and replica sets. Uh, don't use uh, uh, naked pods or uh, bare minimum pod specification because it is not going to help you um, in terms of maintaining the desired configuration. Always use a deployment because a deployment delivers pass like capabilities. Uh, with just one command, you can scale the number of pods and you may argue that is possible with a replica set. But beyond that, deployments deliver uh, history. You know, you can actually record every action that you perform on a deployment, uh, like adding a new version or uh, updating your configuration and so on, which means you can go back in time with just one command. So this is fantastic in terms of managing multiple versions and doing uh, rolling upgrades and all of that. Uh, the best thing is you can also pause and resume work uh, deployments because uh, when you're doing a rolling upgrade at some point, you might want to pause and have uh, different versions of your pods uh, running so you can actually do that so you can you can extend deployments to very interesting scenarios and this becomes the foundation for canary releases and blue green deployments and so on so always use uh, deployments instead of pods so I don't have a demo for this. It's not really required because most of us are familiar with the benefits of deployments. And if you are interested in learning more about deployments, uh, there is a dedicated session that I have done uh, uh, a few years ago. You can look up for um, all, all about deployments in, in my YouTube channel and there is a 45 minute session on that. Um, so moving forward, uh, props, you know, these are very, very important aspects. So uh, what are props? Well, Things can go wrong and things go wrong more often in a containerized world and it is absolutely fine to deal with those uh, outages, disruptions and issues when you are running a containerized uh, platform because uh, most of the times the, the orchestration engine like Kubernetes takes care of restarting the uh, pod or a, or, a, or a workload, you know, when something goes wrong. Um, uh, for example, when you launch a deployment and when um, the number of replicas is set to five and if for some reason uh, one of the pods get disrupted gets disrupt disrupted um, kubernetes will automatically launch a new pod and maintains the desired state that's what we discussed in deployments but um, how do you basically maintain some kind of a health check to make sure that you know kubernetes can make this call and it can decide when to kill a pod and restart it and similarly, when do you know that a pod is really ready? Um, and how do you ensure that you know a pod is taking sufficient startup time before it really starts serving the traffic? So to do all of that, uh, we need to understand probs. And there are three probs that we are going to look at. There is a liveness prob, there is a readiness prob, and there is a startup prob. So all these three probs get attached to a container um, uh, uh, within a pod, and they perform a specific task. So what are those tasks? We will understand that better. So now uh, imagine a scenario where uh, you have a pod, you have a pod that is basically running MySQL and um, before the pod actually comes up, you need to, you need to basically um, import a, a database. You need to uh, import an existing data file and make sure that the database is ready before it can start serving the traffic, you know, before it can become the backend for a web API or a web uh, app. So the importing of the database can take some time uh, and it might be few minutes and it might actually, it might be few seconds to few minutes uh, and you definitely don't want the MySQL pod to become ready before the database is loaded. Otherwise, uh, the end users will see errors. So that's where you use readiness prob. So imagine you write a readiness prob and uh, for every uh, 10 seconds, let's say, you check whether this database is available. Um, and once the database is available, you will um, move beyond the readiness probe and, and then the container or, or the pod becomes ready. So this is one mechanism where you can effectively use readiness. Uh, the other example is when you're actually doing, let's say, model serving of a TensorFlow model or you're using it for machine learning inference, um, uh, basically, 
downloading the model or mounting that model and making sure that it is readily available for your TensorFlow program uh, to basically start serving the endpoint, you need to have some kind of a readiness prop to make sure that you know the most recent model is downloaded and it is available in a specific location. So you can always do that with a readiness prop. Uh, so a readiness prop or for that matter liveness or starter prop can deal with three different techniques to ensure that a condition is met. It can execute a command. Uh, for example, you can always check for a file now you can try to do a cat or you can even do an ls um, to check if a file is present in a specific location and uh, if it shows up that means the download is done and then this will do an exit zero um, and it will continue further uh, similarly you can do a http request you know for example you you are constantly invoking a rest endpoint to see if you are getting http 200 and only after you get a http 200 okay you you move you move past the readiness probe similarly you you might want to do um, a, a tcp socket check you know for example when you're running mysql you might want to check um, you know if if uh, port uh, 3306 is responding or for that matter when you're running a custom workload and it is listening on a specific socket you might want to send some uh, uh, traffic or some packet to the socket and wait for an acknowledgement and after the acknowledgement uh, is positive you might want to really move into the readiness model uh, but that is that's not just readiness but even liveness uh, for example every 10 seconds you might want to do one of these props to make sure that the workload is behaving the way it is intended to so you can run a command uh, periodically or you can send a http request or you can check a tcp socket and based on that you can define the uh, the the uh, health check so these are three popular techniques and they cover most of the scenarios now let's take a closer look at the health checks and by the way uh, every prob has uh, multiple fields and multiple parameters but the most important aspects of this is the initial delay seconds uh, you know before the health check kicks in how long should it wait because sometimes it might be too early for us to do a health check. So you, we might want to wait for some time before we start the health check. So initial delay in seconds defines that. Failure threshold is, you know, when does uh, this probe will tell Kubelet, so Kubelet is the agent that runs on the node responsible for managing the life cycle of the container or the pod. Um, so when, um, when does Kubelet know that something is terribly wrong with our pod? So when we set the failure threshold to X, when that X is exceeded, Kubelet gets to know that, oh, this pod has an issue and let me try to restart it or let me not make it ready. So that is the failure threshold. Period seconds is basically the frequency in which the prob is executed. Uh, you might want to adjust this depending on um, multiple factors for example you know if your http request itself takes a few seconds and your period in number of seconds is less than that you will encounter a lot of issues so period in seconds will basically define how often you execute the prob depending on the uh, type of prob so those are the essential uh, parameters or fields that are associated with any of these props now uh, let me spend some time explaining you when you use liveness, when you use readiness, and when you use startup. Startup is still in alpha, um, so it is it is a work in progress. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but readiness prob is very, very essential. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, you can use a readiness prob to basically make sure that the container is ready uh, before it can start responding to the, to the traffic. You know, it, it, it means it does the um, appropriate uh, 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 groundwork and the initialization uh, before it is it is actually serving the traffic you know this means making sure that uh, one of the external services is available or uh, a specific file is is, is at the right place uh, a service is started on a specific socket you know you can do any of those uh, that through the readiness this can also be used uh, to make sure that you know for example uh, when you have a wordpress pod and a mysql pod you can write an uh, a readiness prob you know that basically um, pings the MySQL pod periodically to see if that is really ready, and and then it will uh, it will basically um, um, bring up the WordPress pod. You know, if for some reason if MySQL is not ready, then there is no point in bringing the WordPress pod because they are dependent. So you can actually use that uh, to perform some kind of uh, basic pre-flight check. Uh, before you bring up a pod um, to 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 uh, serve the traffic, liveness is a constant prop that runs as long as the pod is running. It will periodically execute to make sure that the pod is uh, healthy. So, uh, what happens when the pod becomes unhealthy? Well, um, after a specific threshold, you know, when the failure threshold is set, uh, 
the kubelet gets a hint that it's time to restart. Uh, in some cases, uh, restarting a pod should be just fine because you know there could be um, a memory problem or there could be some issue. Sometimes just restarting the pod would be fine. So what kubelet does is when the liveness prop fails for consecutive times based on the threshold, it automatically restarts the pod. Um, and if that doesn't help, it gets into exponential back off. And that's when you'll actually see there are a lot of restarts happening to your pod. That means the liveness probe is failing and you should understand why the liveness probe is failing by looking at the logs and um, uh, doing some kind of root cause analysis. But liveness probe will ensure that the pod is uh, really healthy during its runtime, during its um, in-flight mode. Readiness is a pre-flight check before you really make a pod ready. Uh, startup is very interesting because it will deal with legacy workloads that are being ported to Kubernetes and you can have extended startup times. You know, when you're bringing a Java-based application into Kubernetes or when you're bringing a very traditional .NET application to Kubernetes and they assume um, additional startup time and initialization time, you actually use a startup prop and it will give you additional window to basically make sure that your pod is ready. Uh, so those are the three props. Now let me show you a quick demo um, on how to use the liveness and readiness props. Uh, so here, you know, let me um, open uh, two files. So basic thing, I have a volume claim and a volume uh, because I'm actually launching a MySQL pod. And then, you know, you actually see that there is a MySQL service and there is a MySQL deployment. What's very interesting here is um, under the containers, I have the liveness prop. So liveness prop will make sure that the, um, that the uh, pod is uh, healthy all the time. You know, and what we do to make sure that the liveness prop is uh, you know, uh, doing the right check. So we execute MySQL admin uh, and we send a ping. So ping basically comes back with a uh, exit zero telling the container that you know everything is good uh, so initial delay in seconds is one you know these are actually not the right parameters i'm, I'm just making it up um, so the actual uh, values could be something like this you know uh, initial delay seconds is 30 that means uh, we will wait for uh, 30 seconds before we do this because mysql would take some time to initialize uh, period in seconds uh, you know uh, how many times do we do this uh, how often? Uh, so this is basically period in seconds. That is 10 seconds. Timeout in seconds. Uh, so you know, if if nothing happens in five seconds, then it is considered to be a failure. So those are the parameters for the liveness prob. And similarly, I have a readiness prob. In readiness prob, I basically execute MySQL command line and I perform a select one query. Um, this will return an exit zero. And that means the uh, MySQL instance is up and running. And then uh, we go ahead and turn the pod into a ready state. So let's actually see this in action. So now uh, let me put um, let me put something in a watch mode. You know, I want to make sure um, we are actually monitoring the pods. So now I will go ahead and uh, run the MySQL pod. So as soon as we do that, you know, we notice that the MySQL pod is coming up and it is now um, in running state. Uh, and if we look at the logs, everything looks good. So we can ensure that, um, you know, everything is fine. So, um, so this is listening on port 3306. It's ready for connections. Perfect. Now I want to simulate a readiness prob error. So uh, what I'll do is I'll basically kill this pod and change some parameters to introduce a fault in the readiness prob. So what I'll do is I'll actually change the username of root to root one. This is just to simulate an error in the MySQL uh, CLI so that uh, when we execute the uh, uh, readiness prob, instead of returning an exit zero, it returns an exit one and that will never move the pod into the readiness state. So um, I'm, I'm changing the username deliberately just to simulate an error and to hold on to the readiness prob so what we can do here is launch the pod all over again. Oops, it is uh, apply. And now the pod actually comes up, but it never becomes uh, ready. You know, you, you notice that it is zero of one and it will be zero of one for a long time, forever, because this is basically um, the, the readiness probe showing us that something is not right and we have not in a mode to take off. 
So the pre-flight check is failing. So when we actually look at the kubectl describe for this pod, so kubectl describe pod, it actually uh, shows us, you know, these are the events um so unhealthy so you know this is unhealthy because the readiness probe has failed with a warning it's a it's using a password on the command line uh, with with uh, a very uh, different username and that is what is failing so it becomes very clear and uh, when you actually look at the state initialize is true uh, ready is false container ready is false pod schedule is true so you know all these are indicators that the readiness probe is failing now uh, that is the first demo that i want to show you and you can effectively use this for a lot of scenarios uh, both the liveness probe and readiness probe. And if you are actually familiar with using the AWS um, load balancer, you know, the, the classic load balancer or the ALB load balancer, you know how you configure the health checks. And particularly when you are using an auto scale group with a launch configuration, you know the importance of configuring a health check and how it actually impacts the scaling up or, or scaling in and scaling out of instances. It's exactly the same concept, but now we are applying that at the pod level instead of a virtual machine level. That's the only difference. Now let me go ahead and delete uh, this pod. We don't need it anymore. And uh, let me move you to the next topic. So I covered two things. One, I spoke about using the right controller type, and then we talked about using the probes, and we have seen how readiness probe and liveness probe can be used. The third one is very interesting, init containers. Now, I learned it the hard way. I, I actually ran into an issue where um, my database server that was running fine with a Docker container on my local machine was failing on Kubernetes. And I never understood why um, you know, the, the, uh, the database pod was getting an access denied when it is trying to create the uh, data directory. And then I realized that I'm running in a highly constrained environment and I don't have enough permissions on the host to actually create a directory. Even if I'm using a host DIR or an empty DIR, I didn't have enough permissions because my container was not running in a privileged mode and I had to really do something before the database could access that. So what I've done is I actually created an init container and within the init container, I use the same uh, persistent volume that my database was using. So I created the directory beforehand and I used uh, chown and chmod to set the right level of permissions on my directory. And um, once that is done, I, I let the database container take over and then it, it is able to uh, read and write because we are actually changing the permissions beforehand. So that was uh, an eye opener for me to figure out you know, how to actually get the permissions right before your production uh, pod uh, you know, uh, runs in an environment. So um, init container, prepares a pod by running the prerequisite initialization steps. And init containers are exactly like regular containers. You know, you, you are familiar with multi containers in a pod. Remember a pod can, uh, can run multiple containers. It is not just one container, but it can have multiple containers. But if you flag one of the containers as an init container, the uh, pod lifecycle will wait for the init container to run to its completion. So it is like a job. Uh, only the job gets over it will continue with the rest of the life cycle of the pod. So uh, an init container must complete successfully before the next one starts. And you can have multiple init containers one after the other, uh, you know, depending on how complex your logic is and how complex the workflow is. So when an init container fails, Kubernetes tries to restart the pod. And again, uh, if this happens multiple times, the kubelet will put the pod in an exponential back off and uh, you will actually see a lot of errors and you can you can you can uh, look at the logs to understand what is going on uh, so it can also be used to enforce sequential instantiation of pods you know the init container could be like the entry point to make sure that the pods uh, the containers within the pod and also the um, other pods are actually starting in a specific sequence because uh, you know, just like the readiness probe, you can use an init container with more complex logic to make sure that one of the pods is available before you launch this pod. And in that way, you can actually um, uh, uh, enforce some kind of a sequence in which the pods are started. So it's a pretty powerful mechanism. Uh, and again, you know, nothing like seeing a demo for init containers. I want to show you two demos. One is using init containers in its basic form. Uh, using a dummy machine learning example. And then I also show an example of using multiple init containers in a, in a sequence. So let me switch to the demo. Uh, 
Okay, so here we have um, we have a simple deployment, and it is called ML Infer. So basically, we are trying to create a pod uh, that is going to uh, host a machine learning model for inferencing, and it runs exactly one replica. It's a standard deployment, nothing fancy. But the most interesting aspect is an init container, and that init container is based on CentOS 7, and I call this as you know, DL model. And what it does is um, it will basically execute the shell and uh, writes a simple line into this file called model slash v1. It says model ready. So uh, this is what the init container does. Now I can actually have a complex logic here. For example, I can use wget to download the model, and then uh, you know once that is synchronously done, I can I can write this string to the file. Uh, and I'm actually doing it to the same volume mount that my uh, ML inferencing pod is using. So within the model slash V1, I'm writing this string. Now, when we move to the main uh, pod that is responsible for inferencing, there we simply do a cat on model slash V1, and we do that in a loop. And again, this is mounting exactly the same volume slash model, and uh, we call it DL. And this is based on an empty dir. So nothing fancy, nothing uh, complex about this. Basically, we want to make sure that um, you know the the init container does something useful before the pod takes off. Uh, what is missing here is the logic to download the model using a wget or a curl. But um, assuming that is done, it basically writes into a file that our inferencing uh, container will pick up. So let's actually run this. So kubectl um, apply hyphen f init one dot yaml. So now this is created, and if you notice, there is an init container, and then pod is initializing, and then it quickly moved into running. It might take a while if you actually perform a download. Now, when we look at the logs, when we look at the logs, um, let me put this in hyphen f. So you know, model ready. So this is what is being printed from our uh, actual container, and this happens every five seconds or whatever time I, I said. But how did this container get the model ready uh, to print? Right? It is basically doing a cat on a file, you know, model slash v1. But this model slash v1 is populated with this string by the init container. Now this is the most trivial way of demonstrating init container, but you get the idea. So uh, you can actually do anything that you want within the init container. You know, you can actually use, for example, in my uh, database example, I, I used a busy box container because I didn't want anything fancy and I just wanted to run CH1 and CH mod. Uh, so I, I, I put a busy box container and I mounted the exact same volume, created a directory, changed the ownership and let my DB pod take off. So it's completely up to you on how you want to handle that. Um, so this is one basic example of using an init container, right? And if you notice, uh, the init container goes right into the spec just before containers. So if I remove the containers, what happens if I remove init containers and move this under containers? Well, there is no guarantee that this container will be the first one to get scheduled or to get executed. We, we can never guarantee that because kubelet um, will launch containers in a very random uh, mechanism, in a very random sequence. So there is no guarantee that this container responsible for downloading the model is, uh, is actually instantiated first. So by simply adding this and moving the spec into init containers, this ensures that the container is the very first one uh, to get executed in a synchronous way and only if it exits gracefully, that is with an exit zero, and if it is not throwing an error, then it will move into containers. So it's a great mechanism for us to perform the initialization and uh, fulfill all the prerequisites expected by the workload. So this is one example. Now I'll also show you the other one. Let me delete this. So I have one more init container uh, or demo. You know, this is a pod, a standard pod, and uh, I have one container which is obviously running BusyBox, and it uh, constantly prints the app is running. But before that, I have four init containers. So the first init container is, uh, you know, printing 
my init container one, it sleeps for three seconds and then it prints complete. And we, we do the same thing with four init containers. And this is just to make sure that you get the idea that init containers can be multiple and all of them are executed in a sequence. You know, they, they are not bypassed or they are not executed in a random order, but kubelet will make sure that the init containers are executed in the sequence that they are put. And only after that, only after all the init containers are gracefully executed, it moves on to the actual containers. So um, let's execute this. And this is going to take a while uh, to initialize because we have four init containers with uh, a sleep command embedded. So let me run this guy um, in a two dot YAML. So now if you notice init zero of four sleep, then goes to one sleep for, for a few seconds. Then the second init container is now executing. It moves to third until then ready is always zero. Then it finally becomes four and there we go. So now we enforce the sequence uh, to make sure that you know all the prerequisites are met before we move the pod into a running state. That is the beauty of using uh, the init container. And this is a very powerful concept. In fact, the combination of init containers and readiness, readiness and liveness props deliver a killer, highly available uh, workload. So if you are deploying anything in production, make sure at the minimum you have the liveness prop and readiness prop. And if required, always use an init container for doing two things. One, make sure you are preparing the pod with all the prerequisites. Second, you are uh, ensuring that the pods are executed in a specific sequence by implementing enough logic in the init container. Just like I mentioned the readiness prop, you could also move the WordPress MySQL logic to an init container. So an init container will constantly try to check if MySQL is up and running. So you have a container uh, that has a MySQL client and you try to invoke the MySQL CLI from the init container and only after uh, MySQL responds uh, um, positively, the init container will exit and the WordPress container will take over. So very powerful concept. Make sure you are using those in uh, your production workloads. Awesome. So uh, let's delete this. We don't need it anymore. All right. So now uh, that was the um, second demo and third concept. So we touched upon using Kubernetes controllers. We touched upon liveness and readiness probes. Then we looked at init containers and it's time for me to talk to you about a more interesting concept called node affinity, anti-affinity, and also pod affinity and pod anti-affinity. Okay, so how many times have you thought of making sure that the pod always lands on an appropriate node? But why do you want to do that? Multiple reasons. For example, I have a database pod and one of the nodes in my cluster has an SSD backend. And I want to make sure that my database pod is always scheduled to the node that has the SSD storage, SSD disk. So based on our understanding, it's very easy for us to use node selector. So inside the pod, you basically put a node selector and you put the label that is associated with uh, the, the node. And then Kubernetes scheduler will make sure that the pod finds its way to the appropriate node based on the label. But that is a very primitive way of uh, doing pod scheduling based on node capabilities. But when we get into some complex scenarios, for example, uh, you have a 500 node cluster, pretty massive cluster, and you want to uh, really manage custom scheduling in, in this large cluster. Labeling these nodes is a big pain. And uh, you know, managing that in a, in a very static form by using node selector is not an elegant mechanism. That is one thing. So it, it, you know, as the size of the cluster grows, node selectors becomes a big challenge. That is one. Second thing is uh, you might want to enforce additional rules. What if I want to say, um, here is a pod, place it on a specific node that also runs a cache pod. So I have a web pod and the web pod has to run on uh, one of the 
uh, uh, memory optimized instances. So there, I, there is already a constraint there. And at the same time, it should also be a node that is running a Redis cache pod. Now doing this is going to be pretty complex. You can't almost do it with a node selector. That's exactly where we get node affinity. So node affinity does matchmaking between pods and nodes in a very, very elegant way. You know, it is definitely extensible than using node selector. And if you're wondering what is the difference between node selector and node affinity, well, the difference between labels and selectors and annotations, right? What is the difference between using labels and selectors versus annotations? Well, labels and selectors is a very rigid way of matchmaking between Kubernetes objects, whereas annotations will give you a very expressive mechanism and very expressive language to, to do the matchmaking. You can actually do um, a subset, you can do a superset, you can do in, you can do not in, you can, you can be very creative in the way you are using annotations. So uh, think of the relationship between node selectors and node affinity as labels and selectors versus annotations. So node selector is very basic label based approach and uh, node affinity is more like using annotations that is more expressive and gives you more power and more control. So uh, node affinity ensures that a pod is always scheduled on a node that matches the criteria or not scheduled on a node that matches a specific criteria because you don't want to end up placing certain pods in certain nodes. So when you do that, you're actually dealing with what is called as an anti affinity, which will avoid scheduling pods on a specific node, right? For example, you are running a database cluster and for high availability, you never want Kubernetes to schedule uh, two parts of the database cluster on the same node because if that node goes down you you have you end up with the risk of losing two nodes of your database cluster so uh, an anti affinity will ensure that uh, the pod doesn't end up on a wrong node uh, you know which which matches a specific criteria so uh, which it is not about not matching a specific criteria but it should match a criteria for example here is a pod here is the node place it only only if it is not running um, one of the database pods. So, you know, that is basically anti affinity or you can, you can think of many other scenarios where you never want to basically place uh, a pod on a, on a specific uh, uh, node. You know, it could be x86 versus ARM. It could be, um, you know, the T2 micro <laughs> that you're running in EKS versus M4X large. So there are a lot of things where you never want a pod to show up on a specific node. So you can actually use anti affinity for that. Uh, pod affinity and anti affinity. You now, pod affinity is basically making sure that you either co locate pods or you don't co locate and you spread them out. Uh, so, that is called pod affinity or pod anti affinity. And node affinity and node anti affinity is how pods make up their um, uh, route and how they show up on one of the nodes or they, they avoid showing up on a specific node. That is node affinity. Pod affinity is co locating pods or spreading them across multiple um, multiple nodes, right? So one of the examples of using um, uh, uh, node affinity is, again, if you are running a database cluster and your, your, your uh, let's say EKS cluster is running across multiple AZs of an EC2 region, AWS region, you want to make sure that for high availability and fault tolerance, um, you want to run exactly one database pod per zone. So based on the node labels, where you can actually figure out if the node is running in a specific KZ, you can only place one pod exactly uh, in that zone. So, you know, that is a classic example of using uh, node affinity. Pod affinity, as I mentioned, is where you'll actually make sure that you don't run two identical pods that are prone to fail together uh, as a fault domain in the same node. So you can actually use pod affinity and anti affinity for that. Uh, I have a very interesting demo. You know, I don't have a large cluster, so I'm not going to really deploy this workload, but uh, I want to show you a very nice example uh, to drive this point. So let me take you to the next demo and show you what I have here. So, so here I have a very simple Redis cache. Okay, so let me split my screen and I'm going to put them in two different windows. So here is my uh, Redis pod, Redis deployment, right? Uh, notice that the label is called store, app store, because it's the, it's the um, 
uh, you know, the label that is that is going to be associated with deployment. And it also has some significance, which I'm going to touch upon. So uh, I put that label and then here I have pod anti affinity. And what is the pod anti affinity mean? So basically, uh, you know, it, it, it really uh, doesn't make sense uh, to uh, to run two cache nodes uh, on the same uh, Kubernetes node. You know, you don't want to end up having two Redis cache pods running on the same node. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Instead, I want to have exactly one Redis cache pod per node. So here I go with pod anti affinity, right? Because pod anti affinity will make sure that uh, it doesn't end up placing two Redis pods on the same. So it's an anti affinity. We, we don't want affinity. We want anti affinity between two pods. Required uh, during scheduling, ignore during execution. This is a very interesting flag. So when we actually say required during scheduling, what it means is this rule of not having another Redis pod is required when it is being scheduled. But uh, during execution, this, ro this rule, uh, rule is not imposed, which means after it, it, it takes off, uh, this rule may not uh, really uh, uh, hold uh, any any value uh, and what does it mean is basically if I change the label of my node or if I change the label of my pod or that's something that will manipulate the rule uh, the kubernetes controller doesn't evict my pod it will still continue to run that's why I'm saying ignore during execution so once it gets scheduled uh, even if the labels change and the rules break it is okay but during scheduling I want this to be required uh, the the kubernetes uh, app sig is actually working on the ignore during execution to become uh, required during execution, which means even at runtime, if you change one of the labels, this pod might get evicted and will show up in another node that actually matches the criteria. So that is the rule here, you know, required during scheduling, ignore during execution. And then the label selector. Um, so the label selector is match expressions, key is app, right? And the value is store, which means no other Redis pod should be running on this node. Topology key, is the way we kind of map this pod to a Kubernetes node. And here we are saying, uh, this, is the this is the embedded default label that is associated with every node. So we are saying, use this key as the topology key uh, at the node level, but at the pod level, use this key. So if the um, host name and the uh, expression matches, then the pod will not become scheduled on it because of the anti-affinity rule. So that is the anti-affinity. Now, let's move to the next uh, deployment. So here I have a web server. Now the web server is pretty interesting. You know, I want to basically locate a web pod in every node that has a Redis pod. So here I define both pod affinity and pod anti-affinity. So here first I define the pod affinity. So I'm saying first topology key, you know, target all those uh, nodes that actually have the host name that match, matches with Redis. That means first rule, target all the nodes that are, are already have um, Redis containers, Redis pods running, number one. Number two, make sure that you know, the pod is actually matching this criteria of uh, app is equal to store. That means you are targeting exactly the same nodes, but also making sure that it actually has a Redis pod beforehand before you launch the Nginx pod. Now it also has an anti-affinity, right? And this anti-affinity is again, uh, you don't want to have, you know, uh, the the um, pod or basically two web pods running in the same node. So you're also spreading them um, across multiple nodes. Even those nodes that may not actually have, um, uh, no, even even those even the nodes you know that basically doesn't have an existing web pod so uh, basically we are saying run this on um, every node that doesn't have a web store just like how we mentioned the pod anti affinity for uh, redis right exactly the same rule but at the same time we are also imposing a pod affinity rule by saying that target that node that already has a redis uh, uh, pod scheduled on it so this is a pretty useful and very powerful technique to co-locate pods or to avoid pods from any kind of a logical collision because uh, you don't want to place multiple database pods of the same cluster in the same node that is anti-affinity 
and you want to spread out evenly to make sure that um, you are uh, not tagged along with um, a, a cache pod that is basically affinity pod affinity you know node affinity is making sure that you always target a specific node um, that has a specific label or matches a condition and node anti affinity is avoiding those nodes that doesn't specifically match a criteria um, so you know that that is how you uh, use node affinity and pod affinity or anti affinity you know depending on how you're actually using them so that was the um, uh, the the fourth concept you know where you can effectively use affinity to create complex logic for scheduling and you can control how kubernetes does the basic scheduling so the final uh, topic that i want to talk about is auto scalers uh, this is the most underrated capability uh, but you know there is no reason why you shouldn't be using this in your production deployments so there are uh, three auto scalers that you can actually use the first one is the most popular and very stable horizontal pod auto scaler the next one is the vertical pod auto scaler and the final one is the cluster auto scale so the horizontal pod auto scaler is pretty much like the hyperscale cloud providers auto scaling engines you know if you are using amazon ec2 you are basically dealing with um, the launch configuration and auto scaling group if you are using azure you are using vm scale sets if you are using gce the google compute engine you are configuring um, the the uh, managed instance groups and you are configuring auto scaler you can bring in very similar capabilities to horizontal pod auto scale and this can basically scale um, uh, uh, depending on two different criteria the first one is the cpu utilization across the number of pods that are running the average cpu utilization or it could also be based on uh, a custom metric right for example you might want to read up an sqs queue or a google cloud pub sub uh, queue and and a topic and then uh, you might really want to define a rule to automatically scale your number of pods so that is horizontal pod auto scaler uh, you can either let kubernetes monitor the average cpu utilization and automatically uh, scale the deployment or shrink the deployment or you can have a custom metric dictate when the uh, deployment gets scaled in and scaled out now vertical pod auto scaler is the the um, opposite of horizontal pod auto scale right logically because it doesn't really multiply the number of pods but it automatically creates a new pod with a with a better configuration uh, and this is applicable only when you are when you're actually using the vertical pod auto scaler uh, um, tool you know which will basically make sure that uh, it is it is monitoring the um, the metrics and the uh, uh, basic execution environment and when it realizes that this pod deserves better resources it might automatically increase the cpu timeshare and it can uh, uh, increase the ram and it can relaunch the pod so the old pod gets killed you know if the auto update is off um, and a new pod shows up and if you really don't want to disrupt an existing pod you can uh, switch off a flag and the vertical pod auto scaler will end up creating additional pods without uh, evicting or without killing the previous uh, old configuration pods so that is vertical pod auto scaler very powerful then there is cluster auto scale so cluster auto scale is a completely different tool you know it is not really a crd or it is not tightly integrated with kubernetes for obvious reasons um, it is an external tool mostly provided by uh, the cloud vendors so cluster auto scale basically negotiates with the underlying cloud providers api and automatically uh, launches additional worker nodes and adds them to the node pool when uh, a specific condition is met now the lethal combination is combining horizontal pod auto scaler and cluster auto scale so when you have these two what you're basically doing is you are optimizing the um, infrastructure and the resources in the current uh, uh, worker node pool uh, you know when uh, kubernetes figures out that it is uh, scheduling pods to the brim and there is no more nodes left to basically schedule the new pod it doesn't match any resource requirement and there is an absolute need to launch a new 
uh, node, it will then switch to cluster order scale, adds a new node, and then uh, uh, you know recalibrates uh, horizontal pod order scaler to make sure that the pods are evenly spread. So uh, this is a very very powerful combination where you combine HPA with cluster order scale, and you can you can do a lot of interesting things. In fact. Um, you don't need to do a lot of configuration or there is not much risk involved in using HPA and also cluster order scale. You know, this is a feature and, a, and an add-on available from most of the managed Kubernetes services like GKE. So when you are launching your cluster, make sure you switch on the cluster order scale flag um, to enable that feature and then uh, make sure that, you know, your stateless pods are uh, associated with the HPA. So, um, in the in the uh, in the interest of time, let me quickly switch to the demo, and I want to show you how to implement HPA. You know, I I don't have a very comprehensive demo because uh, I I don't have time to generate the load or um, uh, make the CPU really busy to show HPA in action. But I'll show you what it actually takes to implement HPA. So that's my final demo. Okay, so here I have a basic Nginx deployment. If you notice, it just has you know a CPU as 250M. So it's a very basic configuration. Now, um, what I also have here is a HPA definition. So HPA is a Kubernetes object like uh, a deployment. So kind is set to HPA, and the um, scale target reference. Apps V1, it's a deployment, and what is it going to target? Well, the Nginx deployment. Minimum number of replicas one, maximum replicas is 10, target CPU utilization percentage is 30. You know, I, I just make it up, but in the production environments, you should be uh, very careful in defining this threshold. Now, this does remind us of the auto scaling groups and the launch configuration combination uh, because we are using exactly the same technique here. We are defining the um, target workload and we are defining the threshold, the cutoff um, for, for CPU and then CPU utilization and then we are defining how many replicas should it run. Um, and if you notice, you know, this deployment has no clue that it is going to be under the influence of a HPA. That is a beauty. So HPA is completely independent and loosely coupled with a specific deployment. So now let's go ahead and uh, deploy this. So first I'm going to run the um, Nginx workload. So you now that shows up here. So we are creating an Nginx pod. Um, so this is not a live demo of HPA where I'm going to increase the number of pods, but I'll show you a uh, few things about that. So, so now we'll actually apply the HPA. So uh, once the HPA is applied, it will now start monitoring the deployment for uh, its, its performance and its metrics. So now uh, we can actually use this nice object called HPA. So it is still unknown over a period of time, it will become uh, better. So um, it will eventually become zero and then um, it will start uh, impacting. So you now this shows us the configuration. It says target Nginx, uh, deployment is Nginx. This is the target 30% is the cutoff threshold. Uh, minimum number of pods is one, max is 10. Now you can also um, use this, you know, basically we are getting the, um, HPA in a YAML form. So this actually shows us some interesting things. Um, looks like there is some, some issue with my HPA controller. Yeah, no, there is actually no issue. It succeeded to uh, associate itself with, um, with the Nginx deployment. So now if you actually notice, uh, this is basically the uh, entire you know, description based on how we are associating the uh, deployment with the uh, auto scaling uh, environment. So this is exactly like the uh, ASG in EC2 or for that matter, any other auto scaler of the uh, public cloud uh, platforms. So that's a quick demo. Again, you know, uh, had I, had I um, <laughs> given additional time, I would have loved to show you the, uh, the actual demo of making HPA work by generating some traffic and increasing the CPU, but maybe uh, sometime later. And the good news is, you know, for each of the things that we discussed, I'm going to do a deep dive. So this is just like this, you know, the high level scratching the surface. Very soon I'm going to do uh, 
one session per each of them like one deep dive on init containers one deep dive on scaling and that's when we actually get to see a lot of these things in action uh, and tomorrow by this time we'll also have the new stack article up and running so that is going to be a, a supplementary article um, for this webinar i'm going to leave a link on youtube um, once i upload the video stay tuned for that so that brings us to the towards the end of this webinar the very first one in 2020 uh, i want to thank our sponsors google cloud uh, for supporting me with all the credits and the backend infrastructure and uh, uh, helping me with a lot of content ideas Newstack, my media partner, um, where all these tutorials will show up. Foghorn, uh, one of the sponsors, a Bay Area based edge computing company. Portworx, um, a storage, a cloud native storage company, again based in Bay Area. I want to thank them for their continuous support. I'm pretty excited to announce the next webinar in the intelligence track, the nuts and bolts of building and managing ML pipelines. And I have the pleasure of uh, having uh, Paper Space join me to showcase their ml pass called gradient and we're going to see a live demo of building an end-to-end -end ml pipeline um, based on one of the sophisticated um, machine learning platforms uh, called gradient built by paper space so this is on january 23rd uh, same time 8 a.m pt 9 30 p.m india time and you can go ahead and sign up at mi2.live and it's going to be a pretty interesting session um, so with that, I want to bring a quick poll um, while I have most of you still attentive. So how relevant was the webinar? Did it, did it meet the uh, promise that I made with the abstract and the teaser? Great. Okay, looks like 97% of you say that it is highly relevant and remaining is um, somewhat relevant. That's fine. Majority um, of you like this. All right, so one final poll before we wrap up this session. Um, how do you rate the overall experience? You know, this includes everything. Excellent. Thank you so much for your feedback. I really value that. I appreciate you taking time to join me for these webinars. And I know many of you are very regular. You sign up the moment you, I, I announce the webinar. And thanks so much for your continuous support. And I'm committed to bring you the best of the cutting edge technologies in the space of machine learning, uh, machine intelligence and modern infrastructure. Thank you. And I'm going to see you on 23rd where we talk about ML ops and ML pipeline. Have a great weekend um, and um, uh, have a have a very um, happy new year. Um, and, and I'm going to have you in my next webinar. Thanks again.